this is how I found out about the death of um, of Yuri Vladimirovich Andropov, who was uh, the last consequential before Gorbachev, uh, Soviet General Secretary of the Communist Party, and a very sinister figure who was very smart and very dangerous and very antagonistic, former chef of the KGB, former chief KGB um, director. And um, and he, uh, uh, luckily, did not occupy that office for too long. He, he was a sickly individual. And... Um, he had done already quite a bit, even that short period of time that he occupied that office to push the world very close to nuclear confrontation. It was an evening like many others. The dedicated drunks Lecha and Alezhek, two of my fellow security guards at the Kristovsky Island amusement sector of the Leningrad Central Park of Culture and Leisure, were sitting at the large plywood top table in the main room of the amusement sector's administration cabin, finishing the last of the three bottles of toxic ersatz sport purchased with money I had given them early and earlier in the afternoon at the nearest liquor store in exchange for their agreeing to take my shift at some unspecified point in foreseeable future. The two could not look more dissimilar. Lecha, who was in his thirties, was flaxen-haired, flat-nosed, pale-eyed, void of any hint of a muscle tone, while Olejek, pushing 60, presented to the world a cue ball bald, sharp-featured countenance, yet trumping all the superficial differences between them was the simple hard fact that they both belonged to the timeless, ageless, million-strong army of eternal Russian alcoholics. For the past couple of hours, they had been complaining bitterly to each other about their lives. They effectively had none, no families of their own, no money, no worldly possessions to speak of, just the acrid smell of their tiny rooms in decrepit, overcrowded communal flats, and no realistic expectations of any kind for a better, more dignified future. While they talked, I was reclining with my eyes half closed in a half broken armchair by the window, beyond which, in the dark, in the meager moonlight covered in snow, loomed in the, hu the hulking diplodocus of the city's only and the country's oldest roller coaster. It was enormous, ominous, and comforting at the same time. In Russian, a roller coaster is called American Hills. You could always simply kill yourself, Lecha suggested to Olejek in a solicitous tone. As long as there is death, there is hope. That's something always to look forward to. Don't lose heart. There is tunnel at the end of the light. Pouring out into two chipped, cheap faience cups the remains of the swill in the bottle, Olejek shook his head with a heavy sigh. Too fucking late, Lecha, too late. I missed my opportunity to kill myself when the timing was right, and now it's too fucking late. Now I'll just have to fucking wait until it fucking happens happens naturally in due course of my growing decrepitude. There is nothing to be fucking done about it now. Okay, here is the merciful death. He raised his cup with his pinky held apart from the rest of his dirty, hirsute fingers delicately high society style. To death, Lecha echoed, and they clinked their cups and drank greedily. You two should go home, I told them, yawning. It's late and it's been my shift for three hours now, and I just want to lock up and go to sleep. They turned their wistful, wet faces toward me. Ah, traitor, traitor, Alejic said with feeling. That's what he and several other fellow security guards there at the amusement sector called me affectionately. Traitor to the motherland, or simply traitor, in reference to my having applied unsuccessfully for an emigre exit visa from the Soviet Union two and a half years earlier, right after quitting my job as an electromagnetic engineer, and shortly before, in a bid to heighten my uselessness quotient, joining the shiftless pool of the shift security guards at the amusement sector. It was a time of bad people in power and the worst time to be a Soviet citizen like me, a Jew and underground writer. It was essential for me and for people like me to keep as low a profile as possible, and no one's profile could possibly be lower than that of a nighttime security guard at the Central Park of Culture and Leisure, charged with the duty of keeping an eye on the roller coaster. You, my dear traitor, you lucky bastard, you will yet see diamonds in the sky and maybe in the end manage indeed to get the hell out of here and go see Paris and Rio de Janeiro and New York and, uh, oh, who the fuck knows what other wonderful places. Andy, even if not, if push comes to shove, you're still young and it's not too late for you just to up and kill yourself, calmly and optimistically. You have your whole death still ahead of you, you bastard. How I fucking envy you, traitor. That's so true, Lochot. 
piped in, mumbling his head, lolling on his chest. Out, Alejic Loja, out, I told them. I'm tired in the American hills and I need some privacy. I want to be left alone. Out, out, you can take the empties with you. That'll be enough for a couple of beers come morning. You'll miss this bus. There won't be another one until midnight. When finally, laughing like mad children and cursing, tripping and falling all over themselves on their way down the steep flight of stairs and out the front door, they had gone. I looked up after them and wandered aimlessly among around the cabin space for a while, not quite certain what to do with myself. I did not feel like plowing my way with an English language dictionary through the book of contemporary American short stories that had been left behind a couple of weeks earlier by some rare wayward foreign visitor to the underground literary club to which I belonged. Sometimes, during my night shifts, one or two of friends would come to the amusement park to keep me company, bearing bottles of wine, and we would while the night away drinking and talking about everything and nothing, about the humdrum lives we'd lived thus far and the imaginary ones that we hoped would st still lay ahead of us. This evening, however, the night air was downright frigid and the hour was already too late for visitors. I went back to the main room and with a spare key that I was not supposed to have, I unlocked the amusement sector administrator's office. I, it was pitch dark in there and the stale air smelled thickly of airsat sport. It did not take long to find what I was looking for in the desk's cluttered bottom drawer, an old portable VEF Spidola, the compact yellow plastic box with black trimming and intensely green cat's eye of a dial, the exact replica of one that I and millions of other Soviet citizens had at home. Back in the main room, I turned the radio on. The air filled instantly with a forest's worth of joyous sounds. Here, in the remote, wooded, scarcely populated part of Leningrad, you could actually get a few foreign stations on the radio. The routine beast-like howling of the KGB jamming frequ frequencies, which suppressed the shortwave radio broadcasts in Russian by, quote, enemy voices in large residential areas along the giant city's irregularly shaped perimeter, was muted, depleted of energy, and disinterested in itself as as though unwilling to carry out its patriotic duties. I had three, quote, enemy voices in Russian to choose from, the voice of America, the BBC, and the German wave. Radio Liberty, deemed the most perniciously and openly anti-Soviet by Soviet counter-propaganda officials, was unintelligible uh, everywhere in Leningrad. They were playing moody jazz on the German wave. The BBC, disappointingly, offered an in-depth overview of the contemporary London art scene. The Voice of America, however, was a different matter. As soon as I turned it, tuned it up, I heard the anchorman saying, in a baritone, too melodious, and the Russian too correct, to belong to someone living in the chaotic midst of it. The official sources in Moscow are unofficially reporting the death of the General Secretary Yuri Andropov after a long... Yuri Vladimirovich Andropov, the refined, bespoke, suit-wearing, tennis-loving, single malt scotch-sipping, terrible poetry-writing head of the KGB, Brezhnev's successor at the helm of power in the Soviet Union, the butcher of Budapest, who crushed the 1956 Hungarian uprising. At that point, as though suddenly realizing that there were dramatic circumstances at hand, the local jamming installation swung into action, commencing to howl and ululate with a doubled fury. I gave the dial a few quick nudges and had and heard nothing but the same enraged howling everywhere, as though the world had suddenly been taken over by a giant pack of wounded wolves caught in a blizzard. I went back into the administrator's office and returned the speedola to the desk drawer in the dark. I lifted the receiver of the massive black beetle of a telephone and, bringing it to my ear, heard nothing but silence. The line, as usual, at night was dead. I was alone in this tiny world of mine, holed up in my cabin. As far as the rest of the world was concerned, I did not exist. And anyway, there was no one with whom I could share and discuss the news of Anthropov's death. Not any of my friends, who likely had gone to bed already, not with my girlfriend, who lived clear across town at least 40 minutes and 5 rubles away by cab, and had no phone in her one-room apartment anyway. Restless, I returned to the main room, switched off the yellow unshaded light there, and stood by the window for some time, with my forehead pressed against the frosty window pane, contemplating the roller coaster's hulking snow-covered mass, placidly mysterious in the pale moonlight. There was nothing for me to think or feel. Something was happening, something was going to happen, that much I knew. I couldn't wait for the morning to come. I winked at the roller coaster, being a feeling a protective warmth toward it. You stupid thing, you be well, I said. It just sat there. 
and drop of a mot I said aloud in French for some reason. My voice sounded hoarse, wild in the night's solitude. If someone, some lost ersatz sport begotten ghost, materializing before me at that moment had told me that thirty years later I would be writing about Andropov's death in English in America on the week when post-Soviet Russia's ruling class made up to a considerable extent of the old KGB cadre would be celebrating the hundredth anniversary of his birth with a large exhibit dedicated to his life at whose opening a glowing telegram from his spiritual successor of President Vladimir Putin would be read, well, I would have known for certain that I had finally and irrevocably, once and for all, lost my mind. I went along the hall and into the room where the security guards slept while on duty, which, of course, they were not supposed to do, on the long, narrow, leatherette couch with uneven cracked skin. Taking off my sweater, I rolled it into a semblance of a pillow, laid down on the couch with my head propped on it, and then picked up from the floor by the couch and covered myself with a stinking ancient communal goatskin that my amusement sector colleagues used as a makeshift blanket. I thought that I would have difficulty falling asleep, given the state that I was in, but this was not the case. I was out like a light the instant I closed my eyes.